Well, welcome again to another podcast of Down to Earth, but Heavenly Minded. And today I got a special guest uh, for our show today. So with that said, just uh, bear with me and we will be with you in a minute. Well, welcome to our show, uh, and today, like I said, we have a special guest. Uh, Ron is with us, and I'm going to do is I'm going to have him introduce himself. Uh, so with that said, I'm just going to move my thing around here. There we go. And Ron, uh, I just want to welcome you, first of all, to my show, uh, my podcast, uh, Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded. I've been doing this for a while, and... Uh, I've got, uh, oh, I don't know, something like 10,400 videos out there, but I don't have a whole lot of uh, interviews. So I think you're about the fourth or fifth interview that I'm doing. And uh, what spurred me to do this is, uh, oh, about 35 years ago, uh, I uh, sent, uh, wrote my testimony out and sent it into a program called Unshackled. And uh, they aired it. And uh, what happened was when they aired it in my area, uh, I got a telephone call from uh, KFSI in Rochester, Minnesota. And they had me come to the studio and they did an interview with me on my uh, testimony that I sent into Unshackled. So it kind of made me think about there's a lot of people that have special stories, special testimonies, and you are one of them. <laughs> uh, anybody <laughs> who you. anybody who gives their life to the Lord uh, uh, has a, a story on how it transpired, how you came to Lord, the Lord. I remember the first time I gave my testimony uh, was up in a little town of Ella in the hills of Wisconsin. It was a little country church. And I was glad they had a uh, podium because my knees were knocking. <laughs> I was very nervous. But like I say, I've been doing this for a while now. So, uh, uh, you, know, you know, it's just something I'd like to do. So with that said, I'm going to have you introduce yourself. Okay. Um, my name is Ron Tyler. I am a California product. Um, born and raised in Hawaii, West Coast, which is San Diego. Um, I was uh, born into an unsaved family. Um, I was, uh, I hope to give my testimony. I was, miraculous to me, miraculously saved. And uh, the Lord uh, has been working on me ever since 1953, September. Um, I... Um, had a rough start because coming from an ungodly home, um, I, it was me, the Lord, the Bible, and the uh, Christians at my church who meant to be helpful but were not really very helpful. Um, and uh, I stumbled along, the Lord graciously leading the sheep on the way and uh, got through uh, high school, finished college, got a degree in anth social anthropology minor Spanish, went on to do social work uh, for the state, for the county, and then I went on to being a teacher. Uh, during the teaching phase, I taught every grade from kindergarten through junior high. I taught adult remedial education at a state prison for five years. I, um, have, I started off in an Orthodox Presbyterian church with a God-fearing, godly preacher who faithfully taught the word. And in, under his supervision, um, at a, I was saved at a camp, Christian camp that he set up. Um, I went on from being a um, good Presbyterian to um, uh, working as a um, youth worker in a, uh, a Methodist church. And then I landed up uh, in a, uh, I got involved in civil rights and I, joined a black African-American uh, National Baptist Church in uh, San Diego. And I became the um, 
college Sunday school teacher during the time of Dr. King's marches. And so I was able to take my Sunday school lessons right from the headlines, giving them the scripture for what was happening during those Martin Luther King marches and the civil rights movement. I, um, I did not receive the guidance I felt I needed from my Christian brothers in my relationship with, uh, with women. And so uh, I stumbled through my uh, 1960s and uh, landed up marrying in 67, um, a beautiful, brilliant African-American young lady, but she was a, a pure babe. She came to me um, for uh, help and guidance spiritually and I failed her completely. I. Um, I, I gave in to Satan almost on the wedding night, which was tragic for her and for me. Um, broke her heart. She was finally, after a year, was at the point of suicide. Uh, I had her parents come and get her to keep her safe. Um, and that became a divorce. But the Lord has been using all of these tragic experiences in my life to help me learn and teach and understand his word. Um, and so I have been active in churches. I went out from the Baptist church. Uh, I, I attended a uh, open communion Plymouth Brethren Church, which is a church of my preference. I just can never find one um, where I am uh, geographically. And so like right now I'm in Boise, Idaho, and there's no Plymouth Brethren Open Communion Fellowship there. And so I am doing the best I can um, uh, visiting churches and trying to find a church home. Uh, my, I raised my children in Calvary Chapel. Um, I married, I remarried, I married again after uh, the first marriage failed. Had was given three wonderful daughters and I raised them in the Calvary chapels. And so I am here today, uh, 82 years old retired very very tired um and i am waiting on the lord uh i my present ministry is online with groups where i teach the bible as i understand it mm -hmm. well that's quite interesting uh thinking back now on your life uh was there a point in your life where you came to realize that you were a lost sinner and you needed salvation? Well, that happened in 1953, when, where I was totally lost and on the way to suicide. I was on my way to the camp where the Lord saved me. I was debating on how I should end my life. Mm -hmm. And was it to jump off the Laurel Street Bridge in Balboa Park and commit suicide? Or was it to join the motorcycle gang down the street? And uh, that was my thinking on the way to the camp. And at the camp in 1953, he saved me. Uh, gloriously, fantastically, miraculously saved me. Wow. Um, I have had another deliverance period, which was a, on the failure of my first marriage. A period of three days, total fasting, no food, no drink, waiting on the Lord, no TV, no radio, no, com no personal communication. Mm -hmm. And the Lord met me on that three-day fast. But even after that, even though he gave me great deliverance and answered questions that had hung in the air for 10 years, uh, unanswered by the Christian community and by my fellow Christians, he answered the questions and gave me this corresponding scripture. But even after that, I still was stumbling along, but nowhere as messed up as I had been before. Uh, I was definitely on the road to recovery after the uh, 1971 prayer and fasting. Yeah. Well, you know, you've uh, you've known the Lord longer than actually I have. I came to know the Lord in uh, September 10th, 1979. Uh, but we're not here to hear my testimony. We're here to hear yours. But uh, I just wanted to just mention that, that... Uh, you know, we do go through hard times, even as Christians. Amen. Uh, yeah, and uh, the Lord sends trials our ways. 
and it's to build character. And we are being conformed to the image of Christ. So every believer in Christ is a Christ one. That's really what a Christian is. And you are to reflect Christ to the world in your life. In other yeah. words, when Christ left and he went, when he ascended and went to heaven, he left the church. And the church is a witness for Christ. And a lot of people think that uh, the church is a building, an organization, but it's not. It's people. It's living Amen. stones. And Amen. just so you know, you're a living stone. <laughs> We're a bunch of little stones, but we got a rock, and that's the Lord Jesus. Now, uh, is there kind of anything you want you know want to add that might have been a uh, kind of an experience in your life as a Christian? Yeah, I'd um, if I and I don't know if we have the time, but I would actually I would like to actually share my trans my conversion experience, um, if that would be okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, we. Would... Um, mm -hmm. I'm 82 years old, and so I'm kind of forgot, forgetful. So I wrote this out for my kids, and this is what is in my published testimony. Um, I was a straight D minus student all six grades in elementary school. I was spanked, or um, uh, I was spanked or suspended every semester um, in through elementary school. They promoted me only because they didn't want me back. They promoted me knowing that I could learn it, but I didn't learn it. And they didn't want me back because I was such a behavior problem. Um, uh, and and at that point, uh, you know, uh, out of tune with uh, school, out of tune with society, out of tune with my parents, I was on the road to suicide, on the road to suicide. I had been kicked out of my church's youth group because I kept on breaking up the meetings by goofing off and standing around. I believed in God and the Bible, but I sure didn't know him personally, and I figured he was unhappy with me like everybody else. I figured at 12 there was no love in the world, that everybody only had user unfriendly conditional love, selfish love, and I decided I didn't want to live in a world where there was no love. I didn't believe there was any love on earth, and for sure, I didn't believe that my mom and my dad loved me. My mom was so desperate to salvage me, her firstborn son, that she decided to force me to go to the church September Palomar camp in hope of a miracle. On the way to the Palomar church, on the way to on Mount Palomar, on the church bus, I decided that since there was no love on earth, I would either jump off Laurel Street Bridge in Balboa Park or join the local street motorcycle gang, drinking, smoking marijuana, and fooling around with the girls until I got killed like so I knew. That night at camp, I saw people doing something I had never seen before, that is, consistently and sincerely loving on each other, sincerely, unselfishly, and joyfully. Mm -hmm. I wanted what they had desperately so i decided i would imitate them so maybe i could fit in and they would accept me into their joyful and loving society i knew what they had was real when i got up that next freezing september morning on mount palomar walked into the men's room and saw guys really joyful and really kindly loving each other heart to heart eye to eye like loving and joyous family a reunion on a Sunday afternoon. All the more, I decided that I wanted what they had and tried to imitate them so I could at least be accepted by them if I couldn't have what they had. I wanted some of that kind love. Mm -hmm. On a noon hike that Saturday, I was hanging out on the edge of the group, trying to fit in and catch what they had. I tripped over a manzanilla root and meant to say, shoot, but I said sheet instead and said it loud enough for them to hear. I and they and I knew that they would hear it as S H I T with a Mexican accent. Mm -hmm. So I felt I had totally blown my cover and that they all now knew that I wasn't really one of them. 
<laughs> I had lost all hope of joining them. I believe they saw me for the faker and the great pretender that I was. I blew up over that Monsignor route, kicking it and hitting the bush while verbally overflowing with stuff like, doggone it, what's wrong with me? I can't do anything right. I always mess up. Just about that time, I think I got it, just about the time I thought I got it right. Then I mess it up and I mess it up in front of the people I wanted to impress. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if she was an angel or not. <laughs> I still don't know. I never saw her before or after that encounter with the bush. That day, I thought she was a part of the church group I saw every Sunday for years. I figured she was part of the uh, group from my church. I never got her name. Later, when I tried to figure out who she was, I thought that maybe it was a young lady at church who looked a lot like her, but she denied that it was her. Well, whoever she was, she came gently over to me as I was kicking the root and hitting the bush and verbally dumping. She quietly stood beside me and asked me if I would like to know why I do things like I was doing, why I mess up. Well, you know that I wanted to know that because I was sick and tired of messing up especially after messing up in the presence of the first real joyful, loving people I ever knew. So she asked me to sit down on a big rock overlooking Don Valley on Mount Palomar, and she proceeded to calmly and quietly explain to me why I messed up and how Jesus could still love a jerk like me, that he wanted a personal and intimate relationship with me to be my God and King, my shepherd and my deliverer, and to make me, forever, make me a forever son of his father. For the next three hours, she showed me gently and patiently how and why Jesus loved me, giving me the Bible proof I had never really understood before. I believed that Jesus was real, but I sure didn't think that he loved me. The proof that persuaded me that God not only could, but actually did love me was that Christ let his body be killed for me, died in my place, took my rap and punishment. I could argue with most other points, but I couldn't deny what, that Jesus died. Even unbelievers believed Jesus lived and died. To me, that was a historical fact mm -hmm. that few disputed. So when I saw that I had solid historical evidence that Jesus let his body be killed, I was ready to seriously consider that just maybe he loved me enough to really let me, to let them kill his body for me. I respected and believed the Bible. So when she showed me book after book, chapter after chapter, verse after verse that plainly stated that the reason Jesus died, <clears throat> that, that solid historical fact, was because God so loved me and the world and because he wanted to love me as my father, as shepherd, as king, as deliverer in a very intimate and personal relationship, my eyes began to see my mind to understand, my heart wanted that love. When she showed me why he let them kill his body, <clears throat> that it was his choice, that he let his body die to take my place in the court of divine justice, well, she had me. I could not deny that his body died. And she persuaded me that God so loved me that he sent his only begotten son to let his body die in my place so that I could be his forever child. Eureka! Yahoo! Hot dog! I had discovered the love I was looking for, a love that I could live for, a love to give my life to and for. I already believed that he rose his human body from the dead and was coming back someday. Now I could have a relationship with the God who was real, unselfish, unconditional, and compassionate, cherishing love. I believed her, except I believed her accepted Jesus Christ as my God, revealed in a human body, Lord, King, and relied totally on him as my deliverer and Savior to make me right with our Father in heaven, and I got all excited. I told her that I had to check all of this out uh, with youth sponsor Chuck Hill to make sure that all that she told me was right on. If she were an angel, then I can see why I, I had to check out with Chuck, because the Bible makes it plain that soul winning is the work not of angels but of the spirit and his human servants. After Chuck confirmed everything the woman had told me, I thanked him and went up the other, other hillside to pray my prayer of thanks 
believing, receiving, and trusting Jesus as my, as my God and Savior. I was such a babe, I didn't realize that I had been born again as soon as I talked to Chuck because I believed and had faith in Jesus and his word. And as soon as Chuck confirmed it all, I believed it. I believed and was born again even before I made my big formal acceptance and dependence prayer a week later. Talk about a radical life change. Within a month my, of my eighth grade year, my grades at which my grades were then averaged B instead of C and D. I was I was a I was a, a leader in my church youth group, my school's Bible club. The girls had a hard time believing I had changed, and I determined to do what I could do for my messed up family, especially my mom and my dad. For three years, I was completely delivered from my porn addiction that my father had got me started on at age 10. But Jesus and his love enabled me to daily win the victory over my feelings of inadequacy, incompetence, and inferiority. I still didn't like me by, by myself, but I loved Jesus, and I liked what Jesus was doing with me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that young lady was an angel, but I never saw her again at that camp after those after that three hour talk. I never saw her again anywhere at any time. Nobody else knew about her, but God used her to keep me from jumping off the Laurel Street Bridge or dying with the street motorcycle gangsters. Someday I would like to tell you about how Jesus spirit drove my car in traffic after I had fainted. Another time after I fell asleep behind the wheel in rush hour traffic and he drove my car for me. And another time when he drove my van, when I couldn't even see the road because of the uh, th the road through the swamp because of the dust storm. Um, but he has made my life a life of miracles ever since, including giving me three precious daughters. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's one thing people realize when someone gives their life to the Lord, they see a life change. And Amen. they can't, they can't explain why, but we as Christians know the reason from reading the scriptures that the moment that you give your life to the Lord, he gives you the Holy Spirit and now God can live through you. And the moment that you give your life to the Lord and, and, you know, people don't, uh, even Christians don't realize this until they read about it in the scriptures. But in Romans, it tells us that we have died with Christ and that we are raised a new being, a new creature. Uh, behold, uh, all things pass away. All things become new. The it's moment that I know I gave my life to the Lord, the old Irv died. He's no longer alive. Yes, uh, I have that old nature and I want to bring him back up. But really, uh, my life has been changed, and I know your life has been changed. Amen. And I just want to let our listeners know that I met Ron online. <laughs> this is kind of an unusual thing. I do a scripture reading, and Ron joined the scripture reading, and we've been kind of meeting on Monday along with uh, a couple others. And uh, that's how I really got to know Ron. But I am united to him, even though he's in California and I'm in Minnesota. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank the Lord for technology, but we can get together and Amen. get to know one another. But someday we're going to spend eternity together in heaven. Amen. Now, if any listener out there does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, you heard a testimony from Ron and even myself, our lives tell you that God is real. He's out there, and he's the same one that went to Calvary and died for us as human beings. And God Amazing. so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, and what, what he means by believing in him is trusting him. Putting your right. faith in him. And I know that the, the day I got saved, I was fighting the Lord. Uh, I was really trying to be saved. I was trying to save myself. And Ron, it sounded like you were doing the same thing. 
Yep. You can't save yourself. There's no way. Right. What I ended up doing is I said, Lord, I'm going to stop trying, and I'm just going to start trusting. Yes. And that very moment I put my trust and faith in him, I became a new person. Amen. Ron, I want to thank you for say, sharing your, your life and your testimony with us today. I'm going to I'm going to end my podcast but uh I'll see you probably not this Monday because we can't have uh, uh the the right. chapel that I go to is having a vacation Bible school so uh I'm not going to do my uh my scripture reading on Monday but the following Monday I'll see you online. Thanks so, for the opportunity yeah. Eric. Yeah, and thanks again and I this is the first time that I'm recording like this so I'm going to hope that it's going to turn out, and if it doesn't, right. I'm going to have you do your th whole thing over again. <laughs> okay. You're going to get right. a lot of practice. Okay, we'll see We'll see you now. Bye, everybody. And I'm just going to fade out of here. Okay, bye.